and we respected that decision. As for how the three archdioceses have responded, this is perhaps the most significant part of this tale, which is they made meaningful reforms. They took accountability and addressed the failings that our special master Bob True identified earlier, making measurable improvements in how they protect children and address allegations of childhood sexual abuse. The diocese adopted the report, the, the report's recommendations from our special master, including a professional and independent investigation system, including providing victim assistance coordinators who have a single job, which is how do they protect and support victims? They also manage their records in a better way to facilitate better reporting and law enforcement uh, reporting, as well as training and investigations processes. And finally, they worked on changing the culture because now there is a new opportunity for victims and parishioners to report child sexual abuse directly to law enforcement and to not have the same fear that previously was part of the culture. The diocese have also committed to a third party audit system to make sure that these newly enhanced functions are gonna operate as designed. They've also agreed on a going forward basis to apply their investigations process to religious order and extern priests who are serving in the diocese. I'm most appreciative the diocese have taken these recommendations seriously and made reforms that can learn from and address this tragedy. Now, I recognize that these improvements are not yet tested and it's gonna be up to the church to ensure that the environment and the culture is one that going forward makes life as safe as possible for children and avoids the tragedies that are told in this report, I'd be happy to take your questions. And again, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. All right, Jesse, I'm gonna let you to go first. Uh, thanks, Mr. Weiser, for, for holding this availability. I, I had um, two questions. One was, can you talk a little bit about why, you know, this was not um, a criminal procedure. And, and I think I understand part of why, you know, these, these cases are kind of past the statute of limitations, even though there is no longer a statute of limitations for child sex assault cases in Colorado. And I also wanted to ask, um, you know, do you think this is the end of this or, or is your office going to continue looking into uh, priest abuse in the Catholic church and, and how that might look going forward? All right, Jesse, I think there's maybe three separate questions. So let me try to get all three of them. Uh, in terms of our engagement and oversight, at this point, the project that we started nearly two years ago has come to a close. There is still a commitment that the church has made to implementing and continuing these reforms. We are encouraged by that, but that will be tested over time. With respect to the nature of this effort, it was not criminal because our office doesn't have freestanding criminal oversight the way, for example, in the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office was able to manage a grand jury process to evaluate the conduct there of Catholic priests. Here, this was a voluntary effort that was entered into by the church with our office to remove what had become a cloud that had cre was created by the Pennsylvania grand jury report. And to give people the reminder, in that report issued by the Attorney General of Pennsylvania, there were stories of priests who were abusers in Pittsburgh, I believe, who then were shipped to Colorado afterwards, which begged the question, what happened after you had a known abuser and you simply looked the other way and sent them somewhere else? This effort that we undertook with the church was designed to answer that question and address that cloud. And then finally, to your point about statute of limitations, I don't have all the details and every case is different, but as you know, uh, if you had a crime committed at a time there's statute of limitations and that time passed, um, then it's not uh, open for a prosecutor to address it. But there is a um, uh, civil uh, possibility uh, that could happen. This was uh, not criminal in nature. Uh, this was voluntary to provide the accountability as well as the compensation that the agreement called for. And we've now proceeded to do both those things. Let me go to Tony.
Tony, you're still on mute. I don't know if. I think you got on mute. How about now? You're good, Tony. Sorry about that. Yeah, Phil, appreciate your time. Two part question. One, your new findings. How much culpability does the Catholic Church have? Uh, how much did they know about these 46 new victims? And, and how, at what level did they cover up and prevent it from coming to the public? And second part of the question is talking to victims. They are frustrated that it's only a civil process and that they've said to me, the Catholic Church has been let off easy in Colorado. How do you address those concerns? First, it's worth noting that since 1999, we don't have any reports of child sexual abuse. And so we are talking about cases pre-1999. The church did not, before this process, make public what had happened. This process is the first time we're having that full accounting. Whether they had covered up before then, I'm not sure what the right characterization is, but they surely were not um, in a full disclosure mode. This process is what called for and facilitated full disclosure so that the stories of all survivors could be told, at least those who are willing to have their stories be told. With respect to would or should there be criminal processes, that's not authority that uh, I have. I will say that based on the authority we have, we were able to work out a very unique and novel process. Many states and state AGs have asked, how do we do this here in Colorado? And it took a collaborative effort to do it, uh, to be sure there have been threats of a extension of the statute of limitations for civil liability that obviously were in the background, but we did this without any legal mandate. We did it because the church was recognizing that their credibility was on the line. And the fact that stories had been pushed aside, hadn't been told, the fact that there hadn't been compensation was wrong. And this process was intended to address it. Kevin, you're next. Thank you. Um, two quick questions. One is uh, the report seems to make clear over and over again that this does not capture the full picture of clergy child sex abuse in Colorado. I'm wondering if this is sort of the, the best you think we can do on that front. And the second question is, uh, following up on what Tony said, there are former archbishops here that are still active in the church that uh, were, were here and in charge when some of this abuse occurred. And I'm wondering, is it just impossible to hold people like that accountable through a process like this? Kevin, I'll take your second question first. We believed that transparency would be one critical way of facilitating accountability. And to your point, if there were people in charge who looked the other way and we've been able to unearth that conduct, um, that has to go forward and the church has to explain their position. They, I believe, have said that any priest who was an abuser that they knew about, they reported to law enforcement, they sought to address the issue. Um, were there others who were enablers? Um, we didn't go uh, all the way down to follow through any possible question. We were more focused on the abuse itself, um, but that's a question the church uh, can and will be asked. With respect to the um, other point, Kevin, remind me now your first question. Well, just the fact that the report seems to make clear that there, this, this is not the full picture of what went on over the last 70 years in Colorado. And I think the major area there that is a issue that we have to find the right solution for is there are a bunch of religious order priests who are not formally part of the diocese and we're not part of this process. So we've not examined allegations of abuse in that context. Going forward, the diocese have agreed to include in their investigative processes allegations of abuse by religious order priests. But as you know, Kevin, that leaves the question about the past. Um, the religious orders 
would have to be willing to engage in a process like the one that we just did for us to be able to have a full accounting or the legislature could uh, take any number of steps that would address religious order priests or for that matter, other organizations where there are such histories of abuse that have not been addressed. Just a quick follow and then I'll be quiet. Do you see a similar effort like this relating to religious order priests or to seminarians? It's going to depend on their commitment to address the issue and their willingness to put themselves through such a process. Um, I can't speak for them. That's going to be a matter that they're going to have to consider and address. I've not heard from them if that is indeed something they're interested in doing. All right, I think Elise is next. Thanks, AG Weiser, I appreciate it. A um, Couple of questions here. Uh, from here on out, what happens if more allegations are reported to the Attorney General's office? You know, are you guys gonna keep that portal open on your website that allows people to report there? Um, and then following up on- <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, do you, do you think that if, if you had the ability to do a criminal investigation, like the one in Pennsylvania, um, would you have come up with different results? And the third question, I know you're being hammered with questions right now. Um, can the legislature give you the power to do that kind of investigation? Let me do the third question first. The legislature, uh, if it so chose, could give us expanded powers, uh, in our, any range of ways. Last session, for example, we have been granted the power to investigate pattern and practice of civil rights violations by governmental entities. That was a new power we didn't have before. We have that power now. So the legislature can always expand our jurisdiction, whether it's for civil rights in that case or for criminal matters. Um, that was your third question. Uh, your second question, I think, was what if we had that power? Um, if we had the power that Pennsylvania did uh, to use a grand jury in a compulsory process and issue a report, we would have been able to possibly use that. Um, and we were committed to making the best of how to address this issue and create accountability for all the incidents that we could investigate. And you had one more question, Elise, your third yeah, question. Yeah, it's from here on out, what happens if someone reports abuse and is the AG's office still taking those reports? We will take reports. The challenge will be, and this has been referred to, um, will reports that we get be actionable? That is to say, will law enforcement be able to do anything about them? We have, uh, during this process, been open to the possibility we would make a referral to a district attorney's office because there would be a case for which criminal action could still be taken. Uh, I am reasonably confident that we didn't find any such case where we could make such a referral. If one were to come our way, we would make that referral in the future. Um, the process for compensation, however, was a window of time that was open. Um, and if someone came forward and said, I'd like to have compensation now, that process has been closed and the final report has been issued. So that would no longer be an option. Uh, and finally, I don't um, foresee a further amending of the report. I knew that a second supplement report was going to be important because we had people coming forward for compensation and after the first report. Um, but um, we, at this point, have no plans for a third report. Colleen. Hi, um, just following up on that question from Elise, the, your answer. You, you weren't able to refer any to a DA's office because of the statute of limitations? So I think that the critical issue um, would have to be, uh, is the statute of limitations still live? Um, and is the individual still alive? Um, we, we, I believe, didn't find any uh, reports of a priest who was an abuser committed sexual assault and is still alive and subject to prosecution. Um, right. I am not, I'm not sure uh, what were the reasons why in each case it wasn't an option, but we started this process with an awareness that that was a possibility. And uh, to, at this point, we have no such uh, cases that have been able to have been unearthed. Thank you. 
and I just wanted to ask the question I had before I thought of that one. Um, th there were some people who didn't want to, after talking to the compensation panel, they didn't want to go ahead and then talk to um, Mr. Troyer. Um, do, you, do you know if any of those cases involve any other priests besides the ones that are named here? Or it, could there be an other priests that we don't know about now because of that? It is possible there are other people out there, and this is something that I think the special master said in his first report, where there are people out there that have not yet come to our attention. And uh, that is something that we did our very best to encourage and enable people to come forward. But I think it is a um, matter for every individual. And I, I, I can't imagine the horror and the pains that someone went through. Some people found this process of disclosure to be healing. Others were unwilling or just not even able to, to talk with um, U.S. Attorney Troyer. And I respect that decision. And to your point, we won't know what they experienced because the compensation process was designed to be confidential. So whatever was told as part of the compensation process, we didn't hear about it unless the survivor wanted to tell us. Okay, thank you. Amy. I think that might have just answered my question, but the the nine new priests that were identified, so none of them are living, is that correct? I would need to double check that. Um, I believe that's discussed in the report. Okay, I'll look over that, thank you. Allison. Uh, yes, hi, um, thanks for taking some questions. Um, are you, to clarify on what you said about Pennsylvania versus Colorado, are you seeking the additional authority to investigate this in a criminal way? You could also get that from the governor of, via EO, for example, and the legislature. Are you seeking that or is that, do you feel like this is sufficient? And I have one follow for that. The, the challenge with the governor appointing us is that's a case by case basis and what was able to happen in Pennsylvania was a much broader investigation about possible criminal activity. Um, I, I, I have to recognize that we're in a um, fiscally constrained environment. And a challenge that we have is we're already strapped. We had to take some serious cuts. As we think about what authority we have, what authority we would use, that's gonna be a critical consideration. And so at this point, I'm not asking for new authority given that we just got this new authority for the pattern practice of rights investigations and we're doing our best with an existing resources to use that authority. So for us, what authorities we have is also related to what personnel and capabilities we have. Uh, and so at this point, we're not seeking new authority. Um, okay. Just to follow up on something you just said, uh, the, the uh, patterns and practices, you've mentioned that a couple of times. I know that was part of SB 217 last year. Um, is that, are you make, are you doing any patterns and practices investigation in relation to the Catholic church? Or are you just using an example? That was an example. Um, the Catholic okay. Church is a private entity. And so by definition, they would be outside of the pattern and practice authority we have, which applies to governmental entities. Got it. Yeah. That, okay. that was just an example of the legislature's ability to expand our authority. Yep. Okay. Got it. Um, my final question is, um, what because this isn't a consent decree, um, you can't go to a judge and enforce the church uh, to you know, make sure that they're doing what they say they're going to do. do you, is there any way of making sure that they do the third party audit? Is there any way of making sure that they actually do, you know, create these systems to prevent child sex abuse in the future? I just, I, I'm trying to figure out the teeth here. The, the church has made public commitments that they are committed to doing this. If they don't do it, um, we would have to see what if any oversight there might be. I, I think at a minimum, uh, they've put themselves out there and they are in a position of needing to rebuild a reputation that was shattered by this tragedy and at a minimum they would have to suffer the consequences of the impact of their credibility okay, thank you seth you're next thank you uh, just a quick question uh, Monsignor Marvin Capuchian, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his last name, it says his abuse was reported in February uh, and he died um, in early April, but the 
diocese or um, the Pueblo diocese didn't report the abuse to police until two weeks after his death. Can you kind of clear up that timeline? Seth, I, um, we need to get back to you on the specifics. Um, I want to make sure I get it right. So um, Lawrence can follow up and we can try to help you uh, work through any of those specifics. Um, and if, if there's confusion that's existing in the report, we'll have to look at that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Tony, do you have another question you wanted to ask? Yeah, Phil, it has to do with the statute of limitations and a lot of people since your original report, and obviously this one will, will refocus those requests. Uh, on the statute of limitations, have you taken a position? Will you reach out to, to lawmakers to ask them to address and based upon your findings of the past year plus, do you think the statute of limitations in Colorado for priests and clergy should be extended? Based on this process, Tony, I don't believe that we need to create what's often called a window. This is being talked about in Pennsylvania to allow suits for civil liability. I believe this process addressed the need that we had here in Colorado for accountability, for compensation, and thus is an alternative to that mechanism. What I would say is if there are other organizations out there that are facing similar crises to their credibility, they can consider a process like this and the legislature can consider uh, a bill along the lines that you talked about. Um, I have one last question that's coming on the chat, which I'll answer if there are no other ones, which is uh, what messages do you have for survivors who've not come forward? And my message for all survivors is I, I am pained by what you went through. Um, this report was hard to read for all of us who read it. It was a reckoning that in our society, people who are in positions of trust, abuse that trust, hurt other people, inflicting trauma that had lifelong reverberations, and that we want to tell your story if you want it told, and we respect you if you didn't want it told. The, the work we've got to do is to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I believe the work we've done in this process has put us on a path to have that. I've got another question coming from Jesse, which is, is that window a lawful possibility? Um, I've not looked into the legality of it um, because I was focused on as a prudential matter, was it necessary and appropriate? And my view is that this process has constituted an alternative and thus it's not necessary and appropriate to do this uh, for Catholic priests. Uh, if this issue comes up for other contexts and we are to look at it both as a matter of is it wise and is it legal, um, we will do that. Great, thank you, A.G. Weiser. Just wanted to thank everyone here as well. This concludes the press conference. If you did not receive the press release of the report with the links to the report, you can find that on our website at www.coag.gov. It's on the home page. Just click on the link and it'll take you to the materials. If you have any follow-up questions, I think most of you know how to reach me, lawrence.pacheco at coag.gov. So thank you very much and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody.